Well, hello everyone, Kaylee Champion, University of Washington, speaking to you from unceded ancestral land of the Coast Salish peoples. In the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna share with you the results of five years of research, 10 different research projects, 11 different folks, six different universities. So a big project to try to understand what's anonymity worth. And with all this research being compiled in one place, I hope you'll pardon me. There's a lot of citations in the slides, but the good news is you don't have to read them. Um, I've cooked the presentation into a two page summary. There's links in that summary, um, slides, recording, et cetera. If you have um, any issues accessing any kind of material, I hope you'll let me know. All right, so anonymity. A lot of different thoughts might come to mind when we talk about anonymity, maybe some of the images in this collage. And sometimes the words privacy and anonymity get used interchangeably, but when we're thinking about them formally and being careful, they're not the same. So we can think of anonymity as a type of privacy or a substate of privacy, uh, but there are multiple kinds of privacy. Uh, here I'm building from work by Weston in the 60s, and one type of privacy we might think about is the privacy of solitude. When you're by yourself, there's no one to be anonymous to because it's just you. There's privacy that comes from reserve, from having a private life versus a public life, or just not being open about certain details or facts. There's a privacy and in intimacy or within a given community, and there's anonymity another substate of privacy, a type of privacy in our interaction with others that is relational and communicational, and it varies by how identifiable we are. So my focus in this talk is on anonymity and Dr. Sanon, who will be speaking later, uh, will discuss privacy. All right, so thinking about anonymity, identifiable details known or can be known by those we're communicating with. Let's think about who are these folks seeking anonymity online? Why do they want to be anonymous? In some cases, there's absolutely an element of criminality. Maybe folks are wanting to conceal the fact that they're violating international law or local law. Some anonymity seekers are folks who have a strong principled preference to remain anonymous in some setting as a right, as a public good, or just as a sense that the powerful are not entitled to our information just because they want it. Uh, some folks, though, have a deep necessity to keep their identity private for safety because of stigma or harassment or oppression. Engaging fully in the online world can put some people's lives at risk. And yet we know that many sites make it quite difficult to conceal identifying information and maintain anonymity. So real name, birth date, postal code policies, often accounts are required. And when we interviewed people seeking anonymity in online communities, they shared with us a very wide range of risks that they negotiate, including harassment, violence, reputation loss, individuals being targeted by abusers, stalkers, oppressive governments, hate groups, or identity thieves based on their online activities. For some people, being able to conceal identifying information is what allows them to live their everyday life using online services in the same way as the rest of society. You or I might be able to say, Russia has invaded Ukraine and write that on Wikipedia without fearing for our safety. But in Belarus, Wikipedians have been put in prison for this. And this is just the latest of example of how actions that are safe for some of us are extremely dangerous for others. And in our study, we were able to hear stories about the necessity of anonymity because we could promise our interview participants that we would maintain their anonymity. But when platforms make decisions about identity, requirements. The folks who need anonymity most are probably not sitting in that boardroom or on that Zoom call. We did a project inquiring to how platforms think about anonymity seekers. What kinds of concerns did platform owners describe? And putting aside things like lost revenue from ad targeting or reselling information to data brokers, one answer is that service providers worry about harassment. Sound familiar? Just like anonymity seekers. Uh, they want to hold people personally accountable for bad behavior. Another, oops, that was not where I meant to click. Uh, another answer is that there are unknown unknowns. It's hard to know the impact of identity policies because the people who don't join your community might not leave much of a trace behind. Another answer 
is that it can be difficult for people who can be identified without fear to speak on behalf of those who lack that privilege. Taking up the perspective of anonymity seekers can be a substantial challenge. So these platforms see a trade-off between safety and risk, or maybe we should say a trade-off between closure and safety sort of bundled together versus openness and risk. So they see problems coming in from perhaps suspect anonymity seekers, and they have a community and environment they want to protect. So we wanted to understand these trade-offs just a little bit more. And Hill and Shaw used a natural experiment that occurred when some sites in Wikia, now fandom, suddenly shifted to requiring accounts and found that this decision carried some hidden costs, not only in terms of newcomers, but also decreasing activity from existing account holders. And there's also some kind of intriguing work that examines positive spillover from negative events. This is not associated with our collaborators, but rather some work from Andrea Gorbati. Her work shows that how even bad contributions to Wikipedia can draw in the work of experts who not only clean up the mess, but perhaps also make other improvements while they're there. So closure, this maneuver that's supposed to keep communities safe, might also harm them by discouraging participation in ways that might be hard to see. And I want to pause here for just a moment because I've said the word Wikipedia a couple times and I just to kind of explain a feature of this work. It is mostly the work that I'm describing is mostly in the context of Wikipedia. Besides being a tremendously important information resource, uh, Wikipedia has a commitment to transparency and folks have done a ton of work to make data available. Behind the scenes in Wikipedia, not everyone knows, is a very large community, tens of thousands of volunteers uh, putting together this resource in 300 plus languages. There's a mix of people who volunteer in Wikipedia who have been around for years, as well as newcomers. Maybe they make one edit and are never seen again. And Wikipedia has its own governance structures, its own policies. Uh, and one of those in most editions at this point is to allow some form of contribution from people without accounts. So this lets us make comparison between behaviors of groups of people whose identifiability kind of varies in a community setting where the work being done has a global impact. Uh, so to kind of dig into the value of anonymity seeking, we ran a comparison of work done on Wikipedia by account holders with some more experience, newcomers making their first edit, contributors without accounts, and anonymity seekers using Tor. The Tor network and browser are a way to intentionally conceal your IP address and therefore your location. And we use Tor as an example of folks who are directly anonymity seeking versus maybe not bothering to make an account or log in. It takes some deliberate effort to use Tor. But you could make similar comparisons in other platforms you care about, verified and non-verified users, uh, people with long profiles and lots of details versus very little being shared, uh, not logged in versus logged in, people using Tor and a VPN and so on. So this gives us some comparisons in Wikipedia, but I think it's broadly, it's more broadly applicable. All right, so what did we find? Uh, first, we found that Tor-based users, these anonymity seekers, uh, contributed to Wikipedia at about the same or slightly better level of quality than other contributors without accounts or newcomers. And in this graph here with kind of these wiggly colored lines um, on the left side in red, this is someone making their first contribution um, with an account. The green here next over uh, are our anonymity seekers from Tor. IP-based based editors, those are folks uh, contributing without an account, and then registered editors, folks with more experience here in the purple. Um, so we observe, uh, as you can kind of see in this graph here, some of the lines wiggle, but uh, the first-time editors, the anonymity seekers, and the non-account holders are pretty comparable with more experienced folks coming in at a higher level of quality. So this is a bit of a remarkable result because I was making some arguments about anonymity seeking for safety purposes and describing people in some really tough circumstances. And now I'm arguing that these folks are all very comparable to others, just kind of living their lives in a way that maybe uh, some of us take for granted. Let's think about maybe unique or particular value. When we did our analysis, we did see 
on kind of the average that Tor based editors, these anonymity seekers, were more likely to contribute to political, religious, and technical subjects, and less likely to contribute to articles on things like American football. Um, but we wanted to investigate this unique value further. This study was done in kind of aggregate and very quantitative. We reconstructed the stories, kind of retelling from digital traces, uh, some of these contributions from Tor using a forensic approach. We found many kind of typical types of contributions being made via Tor, uh, typo fixing, updating facts, and so on, as well as vandalism. And all of this is very typical within Wikipedia. But we also saw some work that kind of connects to a need for anonymity writing about human rights abuses, removing the work of conspiracy theorists. That's work that could get some pushback on the internet. All right, so what about the bad stuff? I don't wanna paper over the kind of vandalism aspect here. We did an analysis of vandalism, same for groups. Uh, and we found that Tor users, that most anonymous kind of anonymity seeking group uh, actually had lower rates of vandalism than other kinds of folks contributing without accounts. They're a little more comparable to newcomers. But one distinction we did find is that vandalism from Tor was more likely to directly attack the Wikipedia community, which at the time was trying to ban them. So I've made the case that there's some good that might be lost, as well as some bad that might be avoided if we exclude people based on their anonymity. But as I mentioned, platforms and communities look at this as a trade-off between safety and risk. So what can these stories about contribution types tell us about this trade-offs? I wanna invite folks to look at a different type of trade-off. So think in two dimensions instead of one. You could apply the same kind of thinking to any community. You could add more dimensions if you like, um, but thinking about the different kinds of activity that go on. Activity in a given community might vary in its value to the community from kind of damaging, which I have down here, and valuable, which I have up here. Uh, but also the sort of importance of anonymity might vary with respect to that contribution type as well, from being sort of irrelevant because it seems pretty low risk relative to other things, all the way to critical um, in terms of the necessity of anonymous um, contribution options. All right. So what can we do if we want to save space for valuable participation from anonymity seekers? There are multiple strategies available. Some communities have chosen to essentially take the good with the bad, fully anonymized participation, embrace of throwaway accounts, anonymity becomes part of the operational model. There's a whole research subfield focused on privacy enhancing technologies, numerous cryptographic techniques in this space to allow blocking of rule breakers without blocking anonymity preserving tools like Tor wholesale. Another set of strategies kind of target this cheap pseudonym problem, trying to make pseudonyms less cheap. And another strategy is pre-publication moderation. Essentially, this is route the work of anonymity seekers for more scrutiny until they accumulate some degree of trust from the community. This is the freshest result from this team. And our observation here is that these communities are able to make a pre-publication model work and to do so without discouraging newcomers and without discouraging account creation. Some of our future work continues in this pre-publication moderation vein. Um, as well as thinking about the value of anonymity. I've been looking at uh, anonymity and handling taboo subjects. Um, we're looking at some solutions that might help support pre-publication moderation, um, as well as we're thinking about new techniques for measuring the value of anonymity. All right, to sum up my case to you, people have good reasons to be anonymous online, but platforms and communities may respond to them with suspicion and not take up their perspective. Anonymity seekers are often comparable to other groups like newcomers and casual contributors. They may offer some unique value or tackle riskier types of work. When they act badly, it may be similar to bad behavior we see from others. Although banning them for being an anonymity seeker may make them angry or trigger a desire to subvert the block. And there are options for mitigating negative behaviors without banning. Okay, so let's talk specifics. What can we do? We can act personally and take stock of our own identifiability, just be more aware where we're tracked or really where we're not being tracked. 
uh, we can path trace the communities we're in. Think about what someone who does deeply need anonymity would need to do in order to join you. So use Tor, don't make an account, refuse all cookies. Is the experience you're having in your own community good or terrible? We can reimagine this anonymous other because they might have the same good intentions that you do. But I think that we don't wanna assume that this perspective taking is enough. Other people's lived experiences can't slide on our feet like a pair of shoes. Empathy can fail us. Instead, I want to argue that what matters is that we listen with sympathy to what others tell us about their experiences. And to do so, we need to seek out the perspective of people in stigmatized groups. This lets us move from personal acts to collective progress. And in community, we can move our debates beyond this kind of closure is safety, openness is risk, dichotomy. We can look for value in marginalized members. We can look for opportunities that to innovate around privacy and access. We can think through our identity policies and think about what we really need to know. We can audit our relationships with vendors and partners, think if their requirements meet our values. And we can continue to keep participation barriers low to help newcomers and casual folks, as well as anonymity seekers. And this is my personal favorite, we can collect data and do research about the impacts of policy changes around identity.